The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. The current financial crisis in Puerto Rico is only the latest chapter in an often troubled relationship with Washington. Since claiming the island from Spain in 1898 at the conclusion of the Spanish-American War, successive U.S. administrations have pursued policies that many Puerto Ricans have considered exploitative. As a result, nationalist movements and calls for independence have been an enduring part of Puerto Rico's political landscape. To help us place the island's current crisis into a larger context of Puerto Rican nationalism and relations with the mainland, we're joined today by Nelson Antonio Dennis, attorney, writer, and filmmaker, and former representative to the New York State Assembly. His latest book is War Against All Puerto Ricans, Revolution and Terror in America's Colony, published by Nation Books in 2015. Nelson Dennis, welcome to International Focus. Thank you for having me, it's a great honor. Well, let's start at the beginning. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the background of the U.S. acquisition of the island. Uh, there was something called the, uh, the Charter of Autonomy of 1898, where at the very end of, of Spain's control, it uh, seemed like the island had some level of, of if not independence, autonomy. But uh, that, that ended very quickly at the conclusion of the war. Yeah, and the, the template was set early when the, uh, after the Treaty of Paris, the United States came in in 1898 and they ignored any element of the Charter of Autonomy. And um, the first governor was Charles Herbert Allen, who basically led the capitalist charge in, into Puerto Rico. He only stayed as governor for 17 months, handed in his first fiscal report to President McKinley, and he conducted agricultural soil sample studies throughout the, the island and found that, surprise, surprise, it's one of the most fertile areas on the planet, especially, he found, for sugarcane. So um, after handing in the fiscal report, uh, Charles Herbert Allen, renounced the citizenship, went up to Wall Street, became a vice president of Morgan Guarantee Trust, and within 10 years he was treasurer, then president, then chairman of the board of the American Sugar Refining Company, which today is known as Domino Sugar. And he set the template for turning Puerto Rico from a diversified, agri uh, self-sustaining agriculture, sh uh, sugar, molasses, tobacco, coffee, fruits, into a one-crop cash cow economy, that of sugar. and. He was so successful at it that within 30 years, 80% of Puerto Rico's arable land was owned by North American banking syndicates. They combined into what was called centrales, and the four largest of which, Aguirre, Fajardo, East Puerto Rico, Sugar, and Guanica, those four alone owned half of that 80%. Four corporations, 40% of Puerto Rico's land. It happened within 30 years. And this governor, Charles Herbert Allen, set the template. And ever since then, there's been a Wall Street stretching from San Juan. There's been a, a, a red carpet stretching to, from Wall Street to San Juan ever since with 20-year tax abatement deals that help no one other than these foreign corporations, and they just leave Puerto Rico in that same cycle of dependency. Well, and I think uh, the, the Charter of Autonomy is significant because there, there are... are people in Puerto Rico certainly at the time made the case that it doesn't matter if Spain gave it to you, U.S., it wasn't theirs to give any longer, right? I mean, wasn't that part of the argument? Uh, yeah, the problem is that we're talking real politique, and Puerto Rico was just the spoils of war. So uh, one could argue concomitantly that, well, sure, y y y Spain did that because they knew that, po that the United States had designs on Cuba and, and, uh, and uh, in the Caribbean. So that, you know, it was just a little bit of public relations on the, on the part of Spain because they knew that they were on their, on their way out. Then, but it does do, does do this. It provides an effective vantage point from, from which to assess the claims and the promises made by the United States because the, the uh, Admiral Nelson Miles, who was the one that came in and uh, uh, enunciated a proclamation in Puerto Rico on behalf of the United States, said that we are now here to provide you with the blessings of enlightened civilization. 
And those blessings and that enlightenment were apparently were far and few, few and far between because the United States ended up owning the 80% of the land. And then anyone who disagreed with it uh, would then be subject to a police administration where they would kill you. And the police chief named E. Francis Riggs, that's the title of the book, they killed Puerto Ricans who disagreed with that. And then he had a press conference, and E. Francis Riggs says, well, if anyone disagrees with me, specifically Albizu Campos, who was a nationalist leader, or the members of the party, or the sugarcane workers who were on strike, um, then we were going to have a war against all Puerto Ricans. Those are his words to the island of Puerto Rico immediately after having killed four of them. Well, uh, you know, if you, if you move it out a little to the region generally, uh, you mentioned the, the ownership on the part of the, the sugar interests on the island. Uh, some interesting statistics. United Fruit at that point owned a million acres in Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia, Panama, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Cuba. And by 1940, United Fruit owned 50% of all pri private land in Honduras. By 1942, 75% of all private land, plus roads, power plants, phone lines, were all in private hands. So mm -hmm. this is very much a regional phenomenon, right? And it's like Puerto Rico was not singled out for this treatment. It was sort of the legacy of, of the North versus Latin America. Yeah, there's an interesting book that, that a lot of, contains a lot of those figures and fleshes them out. And it's actually some sort of Damon Runyon type characters running through this. The book is called The Fish That Ate the Whale by Rick Cohen, and it was recent, published a year or two ago. It's all about the United Fruit Company and how they staged the word filibuster. Originally, it had a, a, an unusual meaning. Filibuster was not to stand up and, and be Jimmy Stewart or, or, uh, or Bernie Sanders, to his credit. Um, filibuster originally meant to go to South or Central America and stage a fake revolution that was actually a disguised right-wing takeover that would install a tin pot dictator that would then yield hundreds of thousands of acres to the United Fruit Company. That's what filibuster meant, it's fake revolution. And um, one of the principal financing entities for this was the Riggs National Bank, which is the lar largest bank in Washington, D.C. at the time. Well, it was the son of the owner of the Riggs Bank, E. Francis Riggs, who was the police chief of Puerto Rico, who was murdering Puerto Ricans, who then held this press conference and declared a war against all Puerto Ricans. So it's interesting how it all kind of fits together. Well, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the, the sort of political pushback then. Um, there's the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party established in 1922. Let's talk a little bit about that. It was actually established a little b before that, but uh, Albizu Campos joined it in 1922. So official, in terms of a de facto basis, that's when it came into real aggressive existence because Albizu Campos turned it from a debating society into a bona fide um, resistance to this, th this imposed regime where they take your land and they call it a gift. And Albizu Campos was the first Puerto Rican to graduate from Harvard and Harvard Law School, graduated in 1921. So that's what exactly, he comes back, he joins the Nationalist Party, and he, and he you know, really uh, makes it in, into something. But interestingly, he editorialized, organized, pontificated, whatever. In, in Spanish, they, in su casa lo conocen. They know him in his house. The United States could care less. It was when he led an island-wide agricultural strike in the depths of the Great Depression because people were starving in Puerto Rico. They were not being paid, they weren't allowed to even have a minimum wage. Puerto Ricans were declared citizens in March of 17, so that they could go to war in April of 17 when Woodrow Wilson de delivered his declaration of war. 18,000 Puerto Ricans got conscript, conscripted into the U.S. Army, got shot at, some died. They come back and they say, well, you know, at least we're United States citizens. But lo and behold, they come back under a series of Supreme Court cases known as the Insular Cases, most notably Balzac v. Puerto Rico in 1922, uh, held that although, yes, there is a Constitution and you're, you're citizens, the privileges and immunities of the U.S. Constitution do not fully apply to Puerto Rico because of the territorial and supremacy clauses. And so, therefore, the minimum wage doesn't apply. Now, this is at this point, people started to get the feeling, you know, 
there's kind of been, been a bait and switch here. They took our land. They give us a citizenship. But wait a minute. It's half of the citizenship. We're not entitled to minimum wage. We're entitled to starve in our own island. And it was at that point when Albizu Campos led the agricultural strike of 1934 that succeeded and doubled the wages from 7.5 cents an hour to 15 cents an hour, which was the difference between starving and not. It was at that point that the United States and Wall Street took notice. That's when they sent in a new, a new general, General Blanton Winship. It was a general, an army general, to be the governor, Blanton Winship, and a new police chief, E. Francis Wiggs, Riggs. And they were the ones that militarized the police force and started shooting the uh, Puerto Ricans because at this point they realized we're going to have to militarize this island in order to continue to impose this economic relationship. And that's what the book is about, how this whole relationship developed and how it finally culminated in a revolution in 1950 that to this day the American public isn't aware of. So uh, what did the party do then politically? There was a, an election in 35, I believe, right? Uh, well, there's an election in 32 that Albizu Campos was somewhat forced into. He didn't really want to, because he never had participated before, but they, uh, they were telling him, look, we're in a depression now. Uh, we need to be, be re relevant, and uh, we're gonna, we need to have, postulate, we need to have some presence. So he ran, but very reluctantly, and that's the only time he ever, he, he, he ever ran. He didn't, he didn't win, but he didn't expect to. The elections were so fraught. Here's what they did the sugarcane owners, what they would do is they, well, you, you may be familiar with this. In, in New York, uh, I've had, I was in a, uh, an assemblyman in New York. I actually had a voting machine grow legs and walk out on election day somehow. My, in, in my most favorable election <laughs> district, a machine disappeared. In Puerto Rico, um, they would move entire districts so that on the day of the election, the Puerto Rican voters would find out that they're supposed to be vo vo voting, say, like 15 miles away. But this is in 1932, when they didn't have many roads or even many cars in Puerto Rico. So that somehow, you know, that changes the vote. And also the sugarcane owners, they would have these huge parties and get everybody drunk on the day of the election. It was, you know, it was amazing. And Albizu Campos knew that this is not something that he wanted to participate in. What he did after that election, 32, was went into an immediate organizing mode to create a national, meaning Puerto Rico, a, a national organization that I, I would insist, that would make the case and insist on complete sovereignty for the, for the island of Puerto Rico. So uh, around that time, then, you've got uh, a series of incidents where many civilians are killed. Uh, in 1935, we have the Rio Piedras massacre. Talk a little bit about that. Well, that was the first um, major event. They had done it in, uh, randomly all over the island, but that was an organized event where E. Francis Riggs shot his police department because they had Tommy gun training. They realized that um, when they were losing this agricultural strike, part of the reason was because the local Puerto Rican police was not quite as willing as necessary to beat people over the head their own people because they lived in their own towns and villages and they shared families. So that's when they had to bring in this new E. Francis Riggs to create, with a new cadre, they brought in policemen from outside and they conducted Tommy gun training and taught the police and recruited new police and brought people in from outside the island so that they could do their, their, their job. And that job was to terrorize Puerto Ricans. The Rio Piedras massacre was where they killed four in Rio Piedras, and then he had his famous press conference where he declared war on all, against all Puerto Ricans. That's the one you just mentioned. But then to deliver on that promise, in 1937, in, in Ponce, on Palm Sunday, on Sunday, men, women, and children coming out of church with palm fronds in their hands, peacefully, with a permit, were marching in favor of Albizu of Campos, peaceful walking down, down the street. The police told them they, they needed to leave, uh, and when they didn't immediately, and when they started singing La Borinquena, which is the Puerto Rican national anthem, when they started singing La Borinquena, the police started to shoot, and they kept shooting for 15 minutes until they killed 17 men, women, and children, and sent over 200 other people seriously wounded to the hospital. And that was known as the Ponce Massacre. And I devote a chapter of, of uh, an entire chapter to that in the book because it's an example, a very grievous graphic example of how the United States was willing to conduct state-sponsored terror on this population in order to cow them into submission. And 
um, immediately then thereafter. Uh, Albizu Campos at that point was in jail en route to his uh, uh, sort of a kangaroo court trial where he was charged for seditious conspiracy against the United States for what? For leading an, an agricultural strike? That was a peaceful, I mean, that was a strike for people to assert their own right to a minimum wage, which the United States had, de had denied them. So that's why he goes to jail in 1936. He died in 1965, 29 years later. He was in jail 25 years, 25 of his, of his remaining 29 years. And the other four years, he was surrounded and followed continually by the FBI. So his crime of Albizu Campos, the first Puerto Rican to go to Harvard and Harvard Law School and to go back and try to organize and, and inspire his island, his crime was to lead an agricultural strike. That's why he went to jail. That's why he was in, went into jail for 25 years, where he was tortured. Well, it's a well, hell of a history. Well, uh, talk a little bit more about his career and, and sort of the aftermath, but first we'll take a short break. We'll be right back. community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back. We're speaking with Nelson Dennis about nationalism in Puerto Rico. So Biso Campos is, uh, is jailed. And uh, what happens to the movement while he's incarcerated? Well, it's, it's kept alive by people like Raimundo, Raimundo Diaz Pacheco and um, uh, Vidal Santiago Diaz and other organizers and, and, and other uh, faithful adherents to the Nationalist Party. But um, what the United States started to do was um, simultaneously support an, another individual to become the first quote-unquote uh, Puerto Rican governor of Puerto Rico at the same time that the FBI becomes very, very uh, visible, ubiquitous, and oppressive throughout Puerto Rico. They, they set up something called the Carpetas program. Carpetas were secret FBI files that were kept on over 100,000 Puerto Ricans, and they were only recently declassified in the year 2000, uh, 16 years ago. 1.8 million pages. Um, they, they're now at the Centro de Estudio Puerto Riqueño and in the Puerto Rican legislature. I foiled not 1.8 million pages, but uh, uh, several thousand of, the, of those pages. And um, the FBI is basically the co-author of my book. I, I chose not to, you know, I figured they didn't need the credit. Um, but the, the, the history in there is so vivid and graphic, and it shows a continual, continual, persistent pursuit of any... They abrogated the First Amendment rights of Puerto Rico so nakedly. And, and the, in 1948, uh, just after Albizu Campos got out of jail, he comes out of jail in, for, in 47, de de December 47, comes to Puerto Rico. Within a few months, Luis Munoz Marin, who was then the president of the Senate, who later became the first P Puerto Rican governor, who was basically an instrument for the United States, they passed this law called Law 53, Ley 53. They call it the law de, la ley de la mordaza, the law of the muzzle. It was a gag law which made it illegal, pun, a felony, punishable by 10 years in jail to say a word, sing a song, whistle a tune, sing la borinqueña, or own a Puerto Rican flag in your own home. That was a fel, pe, felony punishable by 10 years in, in jail. That was in 1948, the same year that George Orwell wrote 1984, which was then published in 1949. Uh, so... As George Orwell is being embraced and the perils of totalitarian government and Big Brother up in North America is a best-selling novel, George Orwell is alive and well in Puerto Rico. And that's sort of a, the, the, the unfortunate history of Puerto Rico that is kind of separated by an ocean, a language, a history, and, and a tremendous amount of cultural misunderstanding. And so much so that what ha to this day, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but what happens in Puerto Rico never happens at all. And it is only for that reason that we're able to have the Jones Act, the triple tax exempt bonds, and a financial control board that's now go gonna go down and basically be a dictatorship in the Caribbean. 
and maybe we'll have some time to discuss that. But it's all of a piece. The same way that the, they, uh, that the, they, the banks got a hold of the Puerto Rican economy and the Puerto Rican land within a few years in Puerto Rico is the same way that hedge funds and foreign owners like John Paulson are getting a hold of the Puerto Rico physical infrastructure now under so, so-called public-private partnerships. Well, I, uh, I want us to, to spend some time in that current situation, but uh, let's just move through what I think is a, a very important period where the opposition really changes its tactics. In 1950, you've got an actual armed uprising. Yeah. Um, when Abisu Campos came back from jail in 47 and they passed his gag law, that would, you, everyone goes to jail for 10 years merely for saying anything or merely for talking to Albizu Campos. They realized that they had to basically throw a Hail Mary pass because Luis Munoz Marin, the first elected governor, now was on this path of... So the, his party was called the Partido Popular Democrático and their slogan was Pan, Tierra, Libertad, Bread, Land, Liberty. But that liberty element, which meant the independence of Puerto Rico, was conveniently omitted once... Uh, Luis Munoz Marin got into office. In fact, one of the first things that he did was very aggressively administer Law 53, the gag law, to start throwing people in jail all over the place. He aggressively re uh, had, uh, um, had J.F. Hoover, Hoover send in many, many more agents in, in Puerto Rico. If you, you Be careful at the bottom of your coffee cup in, in Puerto Rico because there's J. Edgar lo looking at you. In fact, Vito Marcantonio removed the bug from Albizu Campos' room and started cursing into it, cursing at J. Edgar Hoover through the bug. Um, so when Albizu Campos get, came back, he realized our, our message isn't getting, out, uh, getting off this island. People don't know. Do people know what's going on in Puerto Rico now? Not much. You know, and, and this is an era of the Internet and, and, and all the rest. So Luis Munoz Marin was setting up what, what was called a Commonwealth vote, a referendum to establish this new government, which supposedly would, uh, would uh, ex uh, excise Puerto Rico from the list of colonies in the U.N. Because once the United States, Puerto Rico becomes ostensibly a Commonwealth, then it's no longer a colony. But amazingly, the, the, uh, the co-author of the Commonwealth relationship in the Puerto Rican Constitution, who at the time was the Attorney General of Puerto Rico, who later became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico for 11 years, Jose Trias Monge. He was the right-hand person to, uh, to Luis Munoz Marin. He's the one that testified before the UN and before the US Congress. And he was the principal author of that relationship and of that Constitution, Jose Trias Monge. Jose Trias Monge, years later, in 1991, through the Yale University Press, published a very well-documented, well-argued, deeply footnoted book called Puerto Rico, Tri Trials of the Oldest Colony in the World. He specifically repudiated the relationship which he himself created and, and wrote, a, you know, a tremendously, very well, you could get it on Amazon right now, about how Puerto Rico is to this day a colony. And recently, in the Franklin Templeton case, the Solicitor General of the United States, Obama's own lawyer, the United States federal government is in the Supreme Court of the United States right now arguing that the territorial clause of the United States uh, has rendered Puerto Rico to be, to this day, to continue as a territory and the property of the United States, not a commonwealth, a property, and that therefore Puerto Rico does not have the sovereign right to enunciate its own bankruptcy laws. Why? Because Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States. That's what the U.S. government is telling the U.S. government right. today. Well, we've got just a few minutes left. I want to make sure that, uh, that we throw a little light on the current crisis. So $70 billion in debt, 45% poverty rate on the island right now. Uh, 80,000 people left the island, I think, last year permanently. Uh, so what's the situation? I mean, we're, we're actually, as, as we record this, coming up on a, a payment deadline that is likely to pass. So where does uh, the, the government of Puerto Rico stand right now? Situation is the same one that it was 118 years ago. I'm going to walk you through one thing really quickly. The United States goes in in, in 98. 99, Huracan San Siriaco, the worst hurricane in the, in the century, devastated the coffee crop. $50 million of the coffee de uh, demolished. Tens of thousands of farmers are losing the farms. This is in 99. United States sends no, no hurricane relief. Instead, in the following year, 1900, they devalued the Puerto Rican peso, the Spanish peso, by 40%. Everybody had to hand in the Spanish peso, which was of equivalent buying part of the U.S. dollar, for 60 American cents. 
so think about that. A, a 40% currency hurricane, currency devaluation, and then in 1901, the Hollander Act was a steeply graduated set of property taxes specifically geared to the farmers, and they would lose their farms, and that's exactly what happened. The only place it could go was the American Colonial Bank that had no usury law restriction. So when they go to the American Colonial Bank, the bank didn't want those loans paid back. They were more than happy to give the money. They wanted the land, and that's how the United States got 80% of the land through these usurious loans, which made sure that the collateral came into the hands of the North American banking sy okay, syndicates. So, we, so now, so we now... Got, we got like a minute for the next 100 years. Okay. <laughs> so here's what so we are now. These hedge funds, they're, Puerto Rico, they're specifically not uh, disallowing Puerto Rico from bankruptcy. They're paying 30 cents on the dollar buying this debt because they know full well that without Puerto Rico, which is bankrupt, not being able to repay, they, they can get public-private partnerships, P3s, which are actually P5s, public-private partnerships for the plunder of Puerto Rico because they want to own the electrical grid, the water supply, highways, roads, bridges, schools. They want to privatize the entire Puerto Rico economy, and they're going to use the Financial Control Board to be the collection agency for these vulture funds. So after 118 years, we haven't moved any distance. That's why there is a continuing war against all Puerto Ricans. I thought I was writing a history book. It's actually as, as graphic as today's headlines. Well, uh, and we, we haven't heard a great deal in the current election cycle about this either. No, so uh, something to watch. In the meantime, Nelson Dennis, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. The book, once again, War Against All Puerto Ricans. And to our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 